Uh, well, I'm going to be the moderator for this morning's session. Uh, this afternoon's session is going to be configured around panels and discussion. Uh, but we figured that for the morning, um, it would be worth uh, maybe psychologically for all of us to be able to share what it was like working with Bob. So, um, so we're going to make this a series of, of personal uh, uh, remembrances. And we've arranged it kind of roughly chronologically, so over the, over the years, starting from the beginning of your career uh, and moving uh, towards the present. So we'll get uh, progressively newer as the morning goes on. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to moderate this. Um, each speaker will talk for about 15 to 20 minutes. This should be very relaxed. Um, and then we'll stop uh, halfway through for a coffee break. Uh, one of our speakers is actually still on a plane uh, on his way from Delaware. So, uh, so he should arrive just in time, I think, if, if everything goes well. Um, so I'm just going to say a very few words at the beginning because we have a special, uh, a, a special little uh, video to play in a moment. So, um, so this, is, uh, this morning's session is all about the, uh, the re rheological side of things at MIT. Um, Paul has already given you um, a very quick uh, biography, so I'm not going to say much about Bob's career at MIT. Um, I want to say a little bit about his career uh, in rheology. So, so he spent a lot of time uh, on the executive committee of the Society of Rheology in the 1990s. Uh, he was the president of the society from 1994 to 1995. Uh, and, uh, and he hosted the, uh, what was the 65th uh, uh, meeting of the Society of Rheology in Boston in 1993. And I was happy to uh, help him with that. Um, the very interesting story about that is that the first night we got everybody settled. This was at the Omni Parker House, a lovely old hotel downtown. Uh, we thought everybody was settled. We then went home. And then at 4 o'clock in the morning, the fire alarms went off. And so we had 400 rheologists turfed out onto the streets of Boston on a Sunday morning. So uh, um, that was a, an adventure. Uh, there'll be another Society of Rheology meeting here in 2026. So um, if you're free in 2026, Bob, um, I'd love some help. So. Um, he also uh, initiated the creation of the very first Society of Rheology website. Um, at the time, this was new, uh, but I think many of us will remember that Bob was always into the latest uh, innovation, the latest technological thing. Uh, and so websites were a new thing at the time. This was only a couple of years after Mosaic. Uh, and he was really uh, instrumental in getting uh, the Society of Rheology's online presence there at the very beginning. Um, uh, Paul already mentioned Ernie. Um, this was a, a picture that I got. Um, actually, they're dry. I guess this was um, at, uh, uh, when Ernie was leaving for, uh, for Washington and Bob took over. And, uh, and I guess he thanked you by dunking you in, in the dunk tank uh, afterwards. Um, so, so we're going to start, before the first speaker in person, who's going to be Professor Jeff Jackman, um, I'm going to start with just a, a video recording that we have from someone who couldn't be here in person, but really wanted to send their, uh, their greetings to you. So, so this is uh, oh, an old, a very old, uh, an old friend um, from uh, Denmark. So this is Professor Ola Hassiger, and we were able to uh, uh, get together and do a Zoom recording together. Uh, and this is in the way of a question and answer thing, Bob. So you're going to have to answer a couple of questions. OK, so uh, there'll be a slight pause um, as he asks each question. And then I'd encourage you to yell out if you remember things. This is what he wanted you to do. So uh, he does answer the question. So, uh, so there's no quiz at the end of this. But this is um, so. So let's see if this will play. All right, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, um, who is none other than uh, Bob's old office mate in Wisconsin. Uh, Professor Ola Hassiger has a few words for you. OK, Bob. Uh, so uh, uh, I have put my first slide with the title, Where It All Began. Of course, that's not quite uh, correct. It's really where our uh, joint uh, friendship Began. And we began in this building that you see here uh, in the background. Uh, I hope you will recognize it and you can tell everyone in the audience what this building was called and where we started our friendship. So, uh, basically, uh, it is the engineering research building. Uh, <laughs> So he, he decided he didn't want to leave it for too long because he didn't want to embarrass Bob if he couldn't remember. But yeah. Yeah. OK, so yes, so OK, we'll continue. There is a slightly longer pause before the next one. Our joint office was in 1229. That was where we started out. And the office mates, you remember the names of the office mates? There was Ko Higashitani, who went on to become a professor in Kyoto. In, uh, in, uh, in Japan, and there was Marion Hansen and Hui Chang, 
And uh, basically, uh, uh, let me just uh, get back to uh, Koki Gashitani because uh, there was a story with him that I think. Uh, 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 so basically, uh, we were going to a society of rheology meeting, all of us. Uh, in uh, and basically, you see that here. Where and when was this picture taken? Do you have any feeling for that? Okay, we have an answer, St. Louis. Yeah, so it was taken uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Knoxville uh, because the Society of Biology meeting uh, in 1971 was at the University of Tennessee. And going there, uh, we all had, uh, at least you and I and Koei Gashitani, had to go with a little uh, box of slides because we didn't, use, uh, uh, we didn't use PowerPoint at the time. What we did was we drew our slides on uh, basically uh, a piece of paper and we took that to a special department at the university where they photographed the slides. And uh, from those photographs, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the picture, and from those, they made slides, some two by two inch slides for a slide projector. And I remember uh, Ko coming back in the office, uh, having just delivered his slides on the whole pressure era, uh, which was a hot topic at the time. But he was very nervous uh, because we were traveling to Knoxville later uh, that same week, whether uh, the slides would be ready in time for him to take them to Knoxville. And I remember you saying in your soft way, um, uh, oh, don't worry, uh, Ko, I'm sure they'll be ready when you get back from Knoxville. Which is a, a great example of uh, Bob's little deadpan humor there. Of course, didn't uh, uh, really make his uh, nervousness less, but uh, it, uh, I think uh, we both got rather intrigued by this American person with this subtle kind of uh, humor. So at any rate, uh, why we were at, uh, at uh, Knoxville, uh, I took this picture that you see here, and I wish uh, you could identify uh, the other people in the picture. So from the left, we see uh, Hal Warner, and in the middle of the picture is Jim Stevenson. They were also a PhD students of Bob Bird. Basically, uh, it appears that I believe Jim Stevenson got a prize for uh, a poster, and that's the poster prize that, that he got there. Um, so uh, basically, uh, uh, then you went on to uh, your career uh, in, uh, at MIT, uh, but we still stayed in touch because we stayed within, more or less, within the same uh, branch of uh, numerical simulation. And uh, uh, in one occasion we met here, well, you see Bob Bird was there also, and remember, uh, do you know the name of the water in the background? No idea. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, I believe it's Loch Lomond, uh, about 1978. Uh, so that's the answer to that question. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, so I have a, a, another slide that I would like to share with you. So here's a picture you see of Bob Bird in the middle, in the front row, and you see him surrounded by a number of people. And the question is, what do these people have in common? And why are we all in the picture? You see, you're not in the picture, but can you identify some of the other people in the picture? Okay. So, uh, co authors with Bob on different books Ed Dom, in Japanese, uh, Ed Lightfoot, Ron Stewart, a French book on Anna, and Chuck Hurts on the bottom left, something else. Let's see, let's see how Bob did. Um, Maybe you can do that for the audience here, otherwise I will pause a little and, and, and give the result. <laughs> so basically on Bob's left uh, right hand, uh, we see Chuck Curtis, uh, with whom uh, we have uh, worked uh, molecular theory. And uh, behind me you see uh, uh, Warren Stewart, co-author of Transport Phenomena, and uh, you see Ed Lightfoot in the Ritz in the red suit, and uh, now who is the last person in the slide? You know, remember his name? And why is he there? 
Zoom, I already said that uh, we are talking about co-authors to Bob Bird, what, but what was the book that they co-authored? And why is he there? So basically, maybe I can, uh, we can get that uh, in a little while. So you see, it's called Comprehending Technical Japanese uh, by Ed Dow, Bob Bird, uh, and Nubu Inui. So, so there is, in fact, an Inubu, on, Nubu Inui is not on uh, the picture. So he wasn't there at the time. So basically, that's more or less all the slides that I've prepared for you, but I would like to end here by congratulating you very much on your retirement. Uh, and your friendship has meant a lot to me over the years. Uh, I, I think we had a great time together in the engineering research building room 20, uh, 1229. And, uh, you are, uh, and at, at one time, our uh, career is bifurcated. Uh, you, you went into energy, but I didn't have the imagination to change so dramatically. Uh, but uh, it's been very good to know you, Bob. Uh, and uh, you have actually given me good advice on more than one occasion. On one occasion, I was a little unhappy at, uh, in Denmark, so I interviewed for a university uh, abroad, in fact, in the United States. And when I showed you the offer, you said, uh, don't do it over stay where you are and that was a very very good advice you gave me at the time so uh, i would like to uh, thank you for a, a very nice friendship we've had over the years and congratulate you on your retirement so all right well it'll be great so space in uh, engineering research building is we were ne never there at the same time <laughs> I would leave sometime in the evening. I would leave sometime in the evening when Ola was showing up for work. And he would try to talk me into going to breakfast with him. It would be his his lunch or, or dinner, I guess. So we'd find a place at around 11 or 12 at night. And uh, he said, well, just think of it as breakfast. <laughs> so anyway, um, we, we had non-overlap hours. I heard he was uh, he was running on a European schedule, right? So he was coming in for for morning in Denmark time. Yes. So um, so uh, so just a couple more slides, and then we'll uh, hand over to our first speaker. All right. Um, no, nope, not that. there. We go. For me, uh, this was the beginning for me. Um, so this is now a little later in uh, in Bob's uh, career. This is 1986. This really groovy uh, um, uh, brochure. This was the the program in polymer science in. Uh, in 1986, uh, and uh, I saw uh, this description. Um, Paul has already talked about, uh, about about Bob's work in polymer processing and fluid mechanics, and that's what brought me to MIT. So uh, I have very few pictures from the days, but how about that? For uh, that was the original class of, uh, of of PPST or PPSM as it is now. I don't know who this young guy is. Apparently, that's me a few years ago. But um, but that's how we started. Um, I worked with Bob Armstrong and Bob Brown. Uh, they. Uh, sent me to a very nice conference uh, that's a connection with Ola Hasegas. This is the very first uh, conference I ever went to, which was another of these uh, numerical method workshops. Uh, the one you saw from Ola was, uh, was organized at Loch Lomond. This is uh, that's Ola Hasega right there. Um, uh, Bob Armstrong uh, is in the front row, as you see, with Roger Tanner, Ken Walters, John Hinch, uh, and a num number of other fantastic luminaries uh, of the time. So, so it really got me interested in, uh, in this particular field. Um, and this series of meetings is still going on. And actually, in fact, the last one uh, this summer was in Loch Lomond again. So, uh, so this uh, is, is still continuing. Um, Paula mentioned uh, uh, this book, uh, Dynamics of Polymeric Liquids. Um, I dug mine out on the shelf uh, to show what it looks like, just to show that, uh, as she said, it's still in use today. Um, it's held together by tape uh, and uh, a few other things, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's been a, a valuable resource for almost everyone that uh, is in the room here today. Um, and of course, this led to, uh, to the award of the Bingham Medal. Um, and I will point out this, uh, I think this is the only time I know of a case where the book had four, has four authors, including both uh, the first and second volume, uh, and all four of them uh, won the Bingham uh, Medal. So that's, uh, that gives you some idea of the impact that this uh, book had in the field. Uh, and, uh, and this was awarded in, uh, um, in 2006. 
Um, here's the, the uh, collection of Bingham medalists of the time. For those of you who uh, know the rheology literature, you'll recognize uh, many of the names uh, on, this, on this list. Uh, and, uh, and Bob, uh, pride of place in the middle with Bob Bird and Andy Akravos as well. Um, the, way, the reason I wanted to show this is to point out that even then, so this is 2006, uh, Bob was clearly making a transition from what we're going to talk about this morning, rheology towards uh, energy, because this was the title of his, uh, of his lecture, um, was a call to arms for rheologists uh, and uh, thinking about the energy challenge. And so these were the slides, uh, again, a, a hallmark of Bob. Uh, liking um, electronic uh, innovations, he put his lecture up available. It's still available. You can take a look at it. Um, and, uh, and there's a number of things there that will resonate still uh, today. Uh, he was pointing out uh, that even then, uh, Earth's temperature was rising dramatically uh, and that rheology could do a lot to contribute to things. So these are just a couple of the slides, uh, and many of us will work in, in a number of these areas of things that are, that are talked about at the end. Um, and global climate is certainly something that uh, MIT is uh, increasingly interested in. And for those of you who are here, this afternoon will be a session and a set of panels that I think will actually come back to many of these things that Bob was interested in, even though as he won the Bingham Medal. So. From all of us here this morning, thank you, Bob. Uh, this morning is going to focus on, uh, on your contributions in rheology. This afternoon will be more on the energy side. Um, and we're going to start with, uh, uh, with a connection to the Madison days um, with a guy who uh, was there, uh, not at the same time as you, but just after. Um, and this is Professor Jeff Jackman, uh, who's now uh, retired and uh, the, uh, so the chief editor of the Physics of Fluids. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gareth. Well, it's a special honor to be here. Um, I think it's obvious, uh, if you look at the program, I'm the one that doesn't belong. I'm not one of Bob Armstrong's students at all. And yet, uh, it wouldn't be possible for a person to have uh, had a larger impact on another person's uh, mind and career than my own. And everything I have to say about Bob today, uh, uh, because I could go on, is uh, through uh, Bob Bird, what I learned about uh, Bob through Bob Bird, who, as you know, is Bob Armstrong's former advisor. Now, <clears throat> I have a formal title to the talk, and it's about advancements. And if you've been to talks that have the word advancements in them, what you realize is that the speaker runs out of time, and there's no time for any of the advancements. So I've inverted the agenda, and I'm going to go through the advancements. And what I want, and then I will have a comment about Bob and his work um, uh, related to these. So let's just look at these. The work I'm presenting today, by the way, is uh, done by Mona Kenso, who is in the room here today, who has just joined the chemical engineering department here at MIT. One of Bob's greatest contributions to uh, science is, uh, is his deepening of our understanding of the dynamics of polymeric liquids, and specifically that it should be done in two steps that you should respect the molecules and calculate their orientations first, and then figure out how the stresses are subtended from that orientation. The cause of the elasticity of a liquid is the orientation of the macromolecules, mainly the orientation of the ma ma macromolecules, which is different from the way I was brought up in polymer science in John Dealey's group at McGill, and so enters Bob's thoughts and works through uh, my introduction, really, my introduction to these uh, by Bob Bird starting in the year, the summer of 2010. Now, I spent 25 years of my career studying large amplitude oscillatory shear, figuring out how to measure it. I got pretty good at that. 
but I never got any better at understanding it. And then one day, Bob Bird at lunch, I had lunch with Bob Bird for 20 years at the, in, in Wisconsin, every Friday, at least every Friday. And one day he said to me, um, you, you, you don't understand what you're measuring because you don't have any equations for it. And I said, that's true, but I've worked on that for 25 years. And, and he says, well, I know how to get the equations. And I said, I don't think you do. And then he said, the way to get the equations is with co-rotational models. And I said, well, now I'm sure you're not serious because I teach from your, your books and you hardly mention them. And then he says, oh no. He says, I mentioned them. They're in a footnote in a particular chapter. I said, well, I don't think that's a very big con commitment to co-rotational models. And he says, have you read the first edition? And I said, no, I haven't. And then he said, well, you must. I said, well, isn't, it, isn't the second ed just edition just an improvement on the first? He says, no. So I went to eBay and ordered and got it and read it. I had done my homework. And by the next Friday, I understood what he meant. Bob Armstrong authored two revolutions in polymer science, not one. One while he was on the tenure track here in 1977, and then they did it all over again, a completely different way of looking at polymers. For me and for what I was looking for, I needed to understand the first edition. And so began my adventure. I'm about to show you what I did with the courage that I inherited from Bob Armstrong's work. And, and it took me till now, from the summer of 2010 till now, to get there, with Mona's help, of course. So here, it turns out, you, you need to get the first seven terms of the extra stress tensor to understand the molecular causes of large amplitude oscillatory shear flow. And then you'll notice a theme in the equations I'm showing you today. This ratio of I3 over I1, more on that in a moment. And then you can see me stepping through here. All, it, it turns out you need at least the first seven terms. Now, when you're looking at these, I just want you to notice things like the third harmonic here. One of the coolest things that happens in fluid physics is that when you take a fluid and shear it like this, its shear stress responds with more than one harmonic. You, you, you interrogate it with omega, but the answer has three omega, five omega, and so on. And then there's a normal thrust response that responds with zero, two, and four, the even harmonics. Yeah, and then this quantity here is the relevant macromolecular quantity. It's the ratio of the um, uh, moment of inertia about the three, the molecular axis, uh, divided by the moment of inertia about the transverse axis. First time you would have ever seen that, for instance, is in high school chemistry. You would have perhaps learned by rote that the, that the I1, the, the, the moment of inertia of a hydrogen uh, molecule was one half ml squared. We weren't told in high school that there were two other axes and that one of those other axes, the moment of inertia was nearly zero, but that's another story. Now, there's another huge contribution Bod made. And in order to exploit that, you needed a few other material functions. So uh, steady extension we did just in the last few weeks. And you can see for this, you need the first five terms of the extra stress tensor. And then we did this for um, I mean, um, any one of the homogeneous extensional flows. But this is the first extensional viscosity for uniaxial extension. And there's the one for planar extension. And now, of course, as a special case, Bob, we now know uh, the, the, the special case for the rigid dumbbell for planar extension, which I think is new. Uh, a planar extension has two of these. Now, I'm a polymer processing guy, it turns out. So there's a framework of equations that you can learn about in Bob's books. And there's a set of eight constants for that framework of equations. And one of the coolest things ever done in polymer science is chapter six of the first edition, 
where they teach you to form a bridge between continual mechanics and molecular theory. These are the guys that realized that the mathematics of polymers probably has to be inherited by what the molecules are doing and vice versa. And so they showed how to get the constants in this model in terms of the molecular parameters. And so, Bob, now we have a connection between um, those as well, which allows me to make predictions about polymer processing, you see? Now you're saying, well, how could this have been ignored for this long? And there's a story behind that. Mona came to my office one day after completing her master's degree. By the way, that's the last time she saw me in a blazer was at her, at her graduation. And Mona said to me, as she had done a master's on order, and she said to me, uh, I don't want to work on order anymore. So I think what she was telling me is, I will find another advisor if I have to do a PhD on order. And she had hidden her lack of enthusiasm for order for the whole master's degree. Fine. What do you want to work on? She says, I think I want to work on branching. And I said, I don't think you do. I said, a thesis on branching is about tubology. That's what Bob Bird would have called it. You know, you're going to draw one branch, like maybe an H shape, and then spend the whole thesis on that, trying to fix tubology to work for an H branch. And she went away silently. And then about two weeks she, later, she came back. And she said, I think I know how to do this. It's at the end of chapter 16. We can do any structure. And that's what I've shown you here to do, here today, the end of that story. Now, Bob, I retired from Queen's University at the end of last year, so I retired from Wisconsin 10 years ago, and then I re retired from Queen's just a few months ago. I actually retired twice before Bob Armstrong retired. Now, let me uh, move along here, but if you want to understand um, macromolecules, oh, so let me tell you a story here, because I must tell you two of Bob's favorite stories, of Bob Bird's favorite stories about Bob Armstrong. Um, one was, um, whenever you talked about DPL, he loved to tell the story that this book was not his idea. That Ola and Bob Armstrong came to him one day after class and said to him, I think you should write a book on the dynamics of polymeric liquids. And then he said, well, if I'm going to do that, we're going to do it together. Do you understand how much work this is going to be? And then they said, yes, we did. And that's how the project got started. And he says they never let them down. They were on their respective tenure tracks, for instance. They always found the time to get that keep that revolution going. Kirkwood is what you first learn about, right, in, in the DPL. And the basic idea that uh, uh, the relevant property of a macromolecule is that it is longer than it is wide. And that's what confers orientation to the object. And that, in turn, is why I have Kirkwood's book close at hand. Right near where I sit at home. And then also close at hand, I have the original course notes for 525 and 725, the courses that Bob developed while writing this book. And so you see the course notes there? They have like two, it's a two ring binder. If you open it up there, it's got a, a page that folds out into three pages. And the first lecture was spent with the students assembling the book because it contains many, many such unfolding pages that had to be taped together and so on. And also not far are Bob's, Bob's own copies of his own books. Because during the pandemic, he sent me a list and said, Take the ones you want. Tell me the ones you want, which I did. And then he arranged with the department head at Wisconsin to give me his books. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, um, um, uh, he must love me more than he loves Bob Armstrong. And to that, I would answer, is there any other way to look at it? There we go. Fabulous. Much higher hopes for that joke, Bob. There we go. Fabulous. Here's a picture of Bob Bird at Perkins Restaurant, his favorite restaurant, where we did almost all of our work together. And the next slide, I'm pretty sure, I, I, oh, let me lead into it. Many years ago, Bob won the Bingham Medal, and he somehow found out that I had nominated him. 
Bob is a sweet guy, as we all know, so he phoned me and left a phone message. And the phone message was thanking me for all of the hard work that I had done and explaining to me how much he realized, how much work he realized that was. And then um, what I heard in that uh, phone message was, please go easy on me at the banquet roast, you see? Which is how I began the roast. And I, I went back to the roast, Bob, and um, I took a little piece out of it, just a piece. Here we go. Uh, we're looking into the archives now. Oh, by the way, something you never knew, Bob, but this part of the roast had been, had been done, it was Bob Bird's research. When he found out I was going to be roasting you, Bob was a little too old to travel then, so he couldn't come to Portland. But uh, he gave me these materials. He went to the department files and found them. So here's Bob Armstrong's original application, or a letter to Bob Bird, I should say, asking for an application to graduate school. This is 1969. And then if you look at his reference letters, no time to look at all the details, but you can notice he had no noticeable weaknesses. You see, that's an important thing. Well, let's look at the actual Georgia Tech transcript. By the way, just as illegal today as what I'm doing as it was uh, when I roasted him back in the early 2000s. Anyways, here we go. We look uh, many A's here, many A's. What's go oh, something went wrong. Track and field, F. Yeah, there we go. We had uh, Georgia Tech, you get an F, you have to retake it. No problem. Bob redoubled his efforts. Track and field, C. Okay, from which we learned, as I declared in Portland, arms not so strong. Yeah, there you go, fabulous. Now here's the cool thing. Today you'll see all kinds of modeling work trying to explain some slight discrepancy with theory that has been observed with a particular system. But, but let's, let's bring ourselves back to the revolutions that this man brought to polymer science. If, if you take the data from the front end of his books, you see, and you data thief it, and then you put it all together as Stacy Coombs did, you see, this is really what Armstrong is about. He's about explaining everything. And so you can look at these different systems in different ways, but the eta prime and the eta double prime behaviors are almost alike. You see, his objectives, the measure of this man, are far more courageous than most. Ola Hassiger wrote this paper in 74, but it, but, but it was his collaboration with Armstrong that made it understandable to Mona when she was looking for something to do. There were a couple of details in there that had prevented from me, me from ever mastering the end of chapter 16. She mastered those and then we were away to the races. So when I say you have to calculate what the molecules are doing, one of the most courageous papers I ever saw was Bird Armstrong 1972, Steady Shear Flow, where they solve this equation for F first and then do create the mathematics they need to proceed with the problem. And of course, this is done in spherical coordinates. Ah, yes. And then there's a magical moment in that book, you'll remember learning about Euler coordinates. Euler coordinates involve an extra coordinate. You're going from theta phi, problem solved, to three coordinates for the same thing. And that's the magical moment in chapter 16 when you realize, wow, if you look at orientation that way, then and only then can you understood what any other, any molecule other than a rigid dumbbell will do in the flow fields of interest. And that's because of, I think, what we would call in transport this remarkable um, combination of variables where the um, diffusion equation, that's like the conservation equation for orientation, because it turns out orientation can neither be created nor destroyed. You see, the time disappears. And that's the magical moment where oscillatory shear flow was solved, which brings me up to um, um, the um, story I have to tell you. You see, when I got interested in this stuff is when I was on sabbatical leave and Mona was still back in Kingston. So Mona, one of the things she did was decide to write a, 
a more detailed treatment for students in the style of, of Armstrong. Uh, why? Because one of the common themes to Bob's writing is that he always has the graduate student in mind. Think about that. He learned that from Bob Bird. In fact, their citationing is different from modern citationing. It always tells you to see figure this, see equation that, and so on when it's relevant to the graduate student to send them, save them a whole afternoon of work. And every once in a while, you'll see a footnote in DPL that actually corrects either their work or somebody else's work, which will also save you an afternoon. You have to pay much closer attention to what Armstrong writes than with anything else you read. Oh, I'm headed to a particular slide here because we're nearly nearing the end here, but you can see Mona, for instance, working on the effects of branching molecule, structure by structure, molecule by molecule. This is the sort of thing you're able to do with just one worked example and what leads up to it in chapter 16, Bob. Oh, by the way, here's one of the essential elements you'll see in chapter 16, um, the, the relevant characteristic length for a ring would be the distance between these two things, but if you put a bead in the middle, it would be something else. You see? And, and that, whereas before in beadrod theory, we always said meaning of L. So you couldn't compare one different structure from another. Mona decided to change that and make it the shortest distance between two, two beads for any structure. And therefore, um, this brings me close to the end of my talk here, Bob. So just a moment. There we go. Show navigator. I think we can agree, um, Gareth, I'm running out of time. Yeah, yeah, so here we go. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted, okay. So, uh, during the pandemic is when Mona got interested in this subject, and after studying branching, she turned her, she turned her attention to viruses, which turned out to be, I need to hit the return key here, there we go which turned out to be uh, bead rod structures. And so she began not quite sure how she'd get to the coronavirus. Uh oh, she, she said, uh, well, why don't we start with what, what is in Bob's book, the tobacco mosaic virus. And then uh, when I was young, we used to think this was an actual dumbbell, but the microscopy got better for the Gemini virus. So she used that to figure out how the granularity might matter. Still no idea how we'd get there. Then Mona did this uh, virus, it's related to the flu or to delivery of the flu vaccine, and it had some spikes on it in a regular structure, so we went after that. And then finally, she got to the coronavirus. Dug into the archives at the RRC. We had a Friday seminar. I once asked my advisor, why go to Wisconsin? He says, Be why do your sabbatical at Wisconsin? He said, it's the only place in the world where you can do go to a rheology seminar once a week and I got to introduce speakers at that seminar for 20 years. Anyways, here you see Bob Armstrong at one of the earliest rheology seminars with Arthur Lodge uh, uh, presenting. And I think this is Ola, isn't it, Bob, right? And uh, this is Marion Hansen, and this is uh, Millard, Millard Johnson, and this is uh, John Schrag, may he rest in peace. Now, uh, Bob, um, I'm Canadian, this occasion is celebratory, and so I've been working on a, and, and to celebrate in Canada, we sing. So I've been working on a song now for, uh, well, several weeks. Let's see how it, let's see how it goes. Isn't it rich? Are we a pair? Me here at last on the ground, you in midair. Where are the clowns? Isn't it please? <coughs> Isn't it please? Don't you approve? One who keeps tearing around, one who can't move. Where are the clowns? 
clowns, there ought to be clowns. Just when I stop opening doors. Knowing the one that I wanted was yours. Making my entrance again with my usual flair. Sure of my lines, no one is there. Don't you love us? My fault, I fear. I thought that you'd want what I want. Sorry, my dear. Where are the clowns? Bring in the clowns. Don't bother, they're here. Isn't it rich? Isn't it queer? Perfecting his timing this late in his career. Where are the clowns? There ought to be clowns. Well, maybe next year. Congratulations, Bob. Thank you, Gary. So we started from uh, Wisconsin, early days. Um, we're going to now move to MIT. And one of the, uh, the very first people who worked uh, with Bob, and I didn't even realize this at the time until I got to know Osman later, uh, when, uh, you want to plug in? When um, uh, he told me that, that he actually did an undergraduate project with Bob. And uh, it wasn't a thesis, it was just an undergraduate project work, but it clearly small perturbations early on in your career make big differences in what you go on to do. Uh, and you'll see that uh, from Osman, who uh, is joining us here from Purdue. In these interfacial flows, and that is the area that uh, we have been focusing on. And indeed, this is what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow in the MMC uh, seminar series in uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, thank you. All right, so we're going to move from the 1970s into the early 1980s uh, now. And uh, next speaker is Professor Saad Khan, who had just left MIT when I arrived, um, but had been one of the um, first people who'd really uh, spent a lot of time developing the kind of rheology of foams, both experiment and computational work. And so Saad Khan is going to tell us about from rheology to food security. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, so um, it's been a, it's a pleasure to be here, Bob, to celebrate uh, your 50 years at MIT. Um, Susan Muller, who was also my uh, office mate, uh, sent some pictures. She couldn't be here. Uh, so some of the new pictures are baby Bob, um, middle school, sixth grade, high school, and then the Bob I saw is on your left. And so I'm going to start off with a topic. I know Gareth wanted me to be more on rheology, but I took some cues from Bob and decided that I'm going to spread myself and go into other areas in a very superficial way. So we're going to talk about food, not energy. And I'll talk a little bit about how we got into that area. But let me first start off by talking about a problem I had after I graduated from MIT. And that went on for the last six or seven, uh, the next six or seven years. So whenever I talked about my work, the first thing they would come and ask me is, so who did you work for, Bob and Bob? And I would say, no, I didn't work for Bob and Bob. Uh, nothing against it, but I was not working for Bob and Bob. Then they would say, OK, I see. So you're working for Bob Purim. I said, no, I didn't work for Bob Purim. The, Bob Purim was working in similar areas. And so people thought I would work for Bob Purim. I worked for Bob Purim. So eventually, I kept saying I worked for the Bob. And that's the Bob to me. So that's who I worked with, none of the other Bobs. And there are plenty of Bobs in this picture, as you can see. 
So when we started our work, uh, Bob had a project from the polymer processing program. I don't know if it exists anymore. Uh, Nam Su used to head it, and, and this was a project, I think, funded by Martin Marietta Company. They were looking at space shuttles and particularly looking at foams. And I think they wanted Bob to really work on experiments and do a lot of work using these polyurethane foams, which has very nice cellular structures and so forth. Uh, Bob defied those people, and Nam Su was never very happy with our project, as far as I can recall, and decided to work on foams. Uh, the structures look very similar, so he decided that we should probably do some foam uh, modeling, and so we looked at these structures here and saw that there's some similarity, so we started looking at some two-dimensional models. I know Bob Brown is in the audience. He was a little concerned that I will never finish the work, uh, but we got to finish it. Uh, and and, and it, it took a while, but then once it started going, it went pretty well. We actually could predict some viscosity and so forth, and the cellular structures uh, seemed to be resonating with what we were seeing in actual experiments. So I'm gonna fast forward four years. So turns out, if you look at literature now, and in, including our group, People are working on what they call aerogels, but if you look at it, the structure looks very similar to the work we did, Bob and I, and they call it aerogels, and we have been doing some work in this area. Uh, if you look at some of the problems people are tackling, and this is uh, us working, uh, here is a, a picture of an aerogel trying to show that they have some thermal insulating properties. It's the same problem which we were tackling, Bob and I, 40 years ago. Uh, People are looking at, let's see if this comes, at flammability, same thing they were doing with the space shuttle when Bob and I were working, at least 40 years later. And then they moved on to doing other stuff. One of the things with aerogels is a problem with uh, mechanical robustness. So that's something we have and other people are looking at by adding in inorganics to polymers. And then more work is done looking at hydrophobicity, oleophilicity, and so forth. The interesting part is our project was funded for helping NASA. And I actually talked to somebody in NASA this year, and they have a huge effort in this, still going on, in aerogels, not, they don't call it foams, and they're using it, but they're using metal aerogels to collect dust from the cosmic atmosphere and also sending vehicles to outer space. So what we started is still going on and hasn't been resolved. It's in a different name, but in a somewhat different context. So Bob had given a talk in the Bingham Award, uh, talking about how rheologists should get involved in energy. We haven't been that good in doing that, but we have dabbled in the area a little bit. Uh, we started off looking at um, electrolytes, and we brought in rheology where we could show that if you, you can get high conductivity of these polymer gel electrolytes and can manipulate the rheology without affecting the electrochemistry. And that was some interesting work that we did. And then we dabbled some more on anodes, uh, working with my colleagues. Now we had gone into looking at metal doped anodes and stuff to enhance uh, cycling of these materials. And then more recently, we have been working with polysaccharide binders and carbon black, again with my colleague, to look at these things. So we have dabbled off and on, but not as <coughs> intensively as Bob would have liked us to. Uh, but uh, we, we have uh, had a lot of fun in this area as well. But one of the things is that why did I move away from rheology or we are moving, we are doing rheology, but not as much. Part of it is Bob's giving us the cue that there's life beyond rheology uh, and some other area was, uh, was also the fact that when I started my career at NC State, I came in the first day at work, and I was at one of the Bell companies, and at that time, they were trying to get rid of their rheometers, so they sold it to me for a very cheap price using my startup package. So I arrived at NC State. I haven't seen my department head, who was also an alum of MIT, George Roberts, and the grad student said, we'll help you unload the rheometer. So we had this moving truck, and these guys said they won't help us, so four graduate students went. And this is a pretty top-heavy equipment. So they were unloading it, and they told me to stay at the bottom of the truck and hold that thing. So when they were doing it, they felt the rheometer was too heavy. 
So they let go. And this is not making it up. They let go. And I moved, but I couldn't move fast enough, so I, uh, it fell on my toe. And that was my foray into academics, too. I haven't met my department head. Uh, and so uh, the, the students immediately called 911. And they took me to this hospital, which was not too far from NC State. And I met an orthopedic surgeon, and he said, OK, we're going to cut off your toe. And I said, no, let's not do that. And, and so he didn't. And I met him 25 years later. He's now the head of that unit there. And he said that those kind of things they don't do anymore. But anyway, I did survive. But this gave me a little bit of a bad taste, probably. And along with Bob incentive, we sort of started going into other areas, plus the relevance of these areas. So we moved into food security. This is, again, an important area, just like energy. And I think I got motivated more seriously from some of the work going on in Africa. So what happened is uh, I got uh, brought into a project where there was a big push to improve food security, crop enhancement in, in sub-Saharan Africa. In particularly, if in the eastern part, there was a problem with potatoes, which is a staple food. And in the western part, uh, there's a problem, there's a called a yam belt, where there's a problem with yams, which is again a staple food. So what they wanted was a solution which would be cheap and the farmers could use it. So what we came up with, and, and no credit goes to me, is to take some banana plant, take some fibers out of it, make paper, and NC State has a big effort in paper making, and actually create this paper and impregnate, impregnate them with biopesticide. And so what we would do is we make and still make some like 150 to 200 pounds and ship it off to Africa. And then when we do that, the farmers, and these are some yam farmers, they wrap their seedlings and plant, plants it in them. So that was our approach. The idea would be that it has to be very cheap. The farmers would take, uh, be able to use it. And, and we had collaborators there. And if you look at some data, uh, these are potato data from Kenya. These are the bad potatoes. These you can see are much better. Uh, what I want to show you is the yield here. This is what the farmers produced before. And then when they used our approach, they got a threefold increase in potatoes. Uh, they're also these, um, what are referred to as juvenile. These are the nematodes that they're protecting the you know, potatoes from. And so what happens is you can see it goes down, which is what we want. So the insects which are coming to attack the potatoes are going down. If you go to the yam, you see the same thing. These are the, what happens is yam, which is like sweet potatoes, they actually have these nematodes on them after they harvest them. And you want that to be reduced so that when they wash it, it goes away. And that's what we find when we use our approach. And they claim that they have profited by using this approach. So we were uh, quite happy. I actually visited Kenya and Tanzania and met some farmers and talked about stuff. And, and, and that was a very refreshing uh, thing. And then so we started doing that in Africa and then thought, why not take this approach and bring it to a more mechanized system? So my students got into this area saying, we should address foliar problems. There's a lot of problems in the US. And so if you look here about, uh, we have billions of dollars lost because of fungus, of fungus growing on leaves and in various crops. And coming from the south, this is a big deal. We have a plant science initiative in the, in the university. So, and, and so what happens is uh, typically you spray uh, farms with these and you waste about 80% of the, uh, the insecticides that you're spraying. So what my student proposed was that we are going to do make nanoparticles or microparticles that can be sprayed on leaves. And if everything goes OK, we will be able to reduce the number of sprays that you can get away with. So in a very simple approach, what we did is we took some cellulose acetate. And these cellulose acetates are biodegradable. It has to be biodegradable within two years. And we could make various shapes and sizes of particles with various surfaces. These are um, different um, modern, uh, variations of the cellulose acetates. And T stands for surfactants. So if you have surfactants, you can change it too. And basically use anti-solvent precipitation to get these to work. And so we tried these. So one of the things that industry and others wanted to make sure that it works was to see 
does it work on leaves? So what we tried is these are some banana leaves. We wanted, first thing they wanted to see that it spreads and it does spread, especially with, with the surfactant. But the bottom line, it spreads no matter what, better than water, which is what everybody wants. That's the first step. The second step is they want these particles to stick and not get washed away by rain. So we did some rain tests, some simple rain tests, uh, which is like a heavy rain in North Carolina. And we did some confocal imaging to see what the leaves look like before and after. And we have done that for banana leaves, tomato leaves, and then silicone vapor and so forth. The bottom line is, and these are confocal images before and after the simulated rain, that we tend to preserve 60 to 80% of the particles. So this is much, so it gives you several advantages. You don't have to spray as often, and you can use these approaches for various, uh, various crops. So with that going on, my student came in, and this was a new student, and she said that why don't we make pickering emulsions out of these particles? And so the idea of pickering emulsions is typically the emulsions are surfactant stabilized, but we use, use the particles. These are amphiphilic, so hopefully it'll work and we will get these emulsions stabilized. The idea behind is that if you have these pickering emulsions, then maybe you can have uh, nutrients for the plants in the oil phase, um, also in the particles, so you can have multiple active ingredients that can help the plant grow. And, and it turned out that it does work and it's an oil and water emulsion, and so that makes it easier. If it's a, a water-based system, you can deliver it to the uh, plants and that should work. And so we have, and I've skipped a few slides to keep this short, we have incorporated agro agrochemicals such as abamectin, which is a nematicide which can act to, to kill nematodes or insects. And more recently, people are looking at uh, bacteria or biologics to help the plant grow. So we've incorporated both of them. And, and this seems to work pretty well, but one of the things we found is that when we try to put these systems in the soil or on the seed, we need to know what the rheology is. So even though we started with food security, we have to know what the rheology is. So it turns out that they are gels and depending on the concentration, they can be weak or strong gels. The other interesting part is that they also have yield stress. And uh, all you need to know is that this maxima corresponds to the yield stress. And depending on the kind of pickering emulsions we have, we can have a single yield stress or two yield stresses or a continuum yield stress. This is something Anthony Beres, who is going to speak next, had done in part of his research too. So we are seeing some of these phenomena and we can explain this, but this is not the right audience. But the reason I bring this up is that we cannot get low, uh, let go of rheology. So we started out, we did food security, but at the end of the day, we need rheology to implement it. And if you go back many years ago, Bob and I were looking at yield stress of foam. So we had yield stress of picker and emulsions now. And we got a single yield stress and things weren't as easy to measure. And now we have multiple yield stresses showing up in picker and emulsion. So things started out 40 years ago and maybe because of Bob's influence, we are still uh, doing the same work, but on different systems and getting somewhat new results, but just as exciting. So thank you, Bob, uh, for giving uh, the knowledge base. I could never figure out the volume two, so I never read it, nor did I open it. The volume <laughs> one, volume one was pretty tough for me as is, so I'm sticking to volume one. Volume two is not gonna show up. It's on my shelf, but that's a little bit too much for me. So thank you. Uh, we're going to take a break for 15 minutes. Uh, right now, we'll start, we'll convene again at 11 o'clock. Um, I think there's some refreshments at the back in the corner, uh, and we'll start again in, in 15 minutes. Thank you.